So today we're going to be talking about families of fungi that are commonly encountered here in the southeastern U.S. And the majority of fungi that we're going to be talking about today are going to be basidiomycota fungi. And the vast majority of macroscopic fungi, or fungi that we can see without the aid of a microscope, are going to be basidiomycetes. Uh, these fungi have sexually reproductive spores produced on structures called basidia, hence the basidiomycete name. And most of these fungi are what we think of when we think of mushrooms. They have gills, pores, or teeth on the underside of their cap on which their basidiospores are, are held. And uh, nearly all macroscopic fungi are going to be basidiomycetes with a few exceptions. The first family of fungi we're going to be talking about today are in the Rustulaceae. And the Rustulaceae are composed of two large groups of fungi, uh, the Lactarius and the Rustula. These fungi are characterized by a really brittle texture to the fruiting body. And this brittle, brittle texture is due to these spherocysts, these large roundish shell, cells in the hyphal tissue that give these fungi uh, their brittle texture, and it, which is distinctive to this family of fungi. The spores in this family are typically very ornamented. They tend to have a lot of warts or spines or ridges. Now this isn't something you're going to see without the aid of a microscope. But if you were to do a spore print or try to look at the spores of fungi in this family under a microscope, you would probably see these very ornamented spore features. The Rustulaceae have these two families, Lactarius and Rustula, and they are distinct from each other, these two uh, genera are, in a couple of ways. And one of the most distinctive being that Lactarius fungi ooze a latex when they're bruised or cut, and Rustulas, uh, they are similarly brittle. They tend to snap like chalk on the stipes. When you, uh, when you break the stipe, it tends to be very brittle and have an almost chalk-like snap to it. But they do not have the latex that the Lactarius genus does. So Lactarius, latex, Rustula, no latex. Spore color tends to be really uh, variable within this family, uh, anywhere from white to buff or ochre-colored spores, which is a little bit distinctive and different from some other families of fungi that we'll, talking, we'll be talking about today, where spore color tends to be pretty set, with maybe one or two colors of spores being typical. Here there's a lot of variability. And these fungi are often mycorrhizal and they tend to fruit in groups uh, under, under trees. So where you see one Lactarius or Russula, chances are there's probably more nearby because as they are mycorrhizal, they're going to fruit in clusters and in groups in association with the roots of whatever tree they have that mycorrhizal relationship with. The, the Lactarius fungi that produce that latex, usually it's pretty easy to spot because that latex tends to ooze very readily from the cap and the gills when, the, when they're bruised in any way. And here you can see that latex very readily beginning to, to ooze from a lactarius mushroom that was, uh, that was scored and cut. The Hygrophoraceae are a family of mushrooms that have some of my favorite mushrooms in them. Uh, often these mushrooms are small to medium sized, rather diminutive, often terrestrial, but not always. There are some, like the one in the picture, that do grow on wood but the vast majority of them are going to be terrestrial mushrooms, meaning that they're growing out of the ground. The primary genera in the Hygrophoraceae family are going to be the Hygrocybe and the Hygrophorus mushrooms, so pretty easy to remember. They're mostly saprophytic, with a few exceptions. Uh, the Hygrophorus mushrooms are mycorrhizal, so not all saprophytes. Hygrocybe are saprophytes, and the Hygrophorus are very often mycorrhizal fungi. The caps on these mushrooms are smooth and often slightly viscid. Viscid, when we're talking about fungi, means slimy. So they tend to be kind of sticky or, or oozy on top. They have a very viscid feel to the cap of these fungi. And they're often very brightly colored, especially in the hygrospe fungi, which are especially known for this really bright coloring. The gills are soft and well spaced, and they're usually attached to the stipe, which is the stalk of the mushroom. 
So gills are usually attached and they usually have a very waxy feel to them. Often when I turn a hygroscopy mushroom over and look at the gills on the underside, you can run your finger over them and they won't probably break unless you're applying a decent amount of pressure. They tend to have some give to them, like, like candle wax. The stipe is usually centrally located on these mushrooms, uh, so not off to one side, kind of like a perfect little umbrella there under the cap of the mushroom. The spore print on these mushrooms is white. It's going to be white, as far as I'm aware, on almost any of the hygrosibi or hygrophorus mushrooms that you look at. And these mushrooms, as they're most of saprophytes, are not going to be mycorrhizal. Uh, they don't have associations with the roots of trees. The Trichalomataceae, this is a, a family of fungi that is no longer one family. These fungi have been reclassified now into different, different families based upon, um, upon genetics and phylogenetic work. We now know that these mushrooms are not all in the Trichalomataceae. This used to be a catch-all group, though, for a lot of these different genera of fungi that have now been reclassified to different families. But for lack of a headache and ease of understanding today, we're going to treat all of these genera under this Trichalomataceae family, even though that's not the current taxonomic classification for these fungi. And that's just something to be aware of as we go forward. So you can see why this Trichalomataceae family used to be a catch-all for fungi that didn't really seem to belong anywhere else, and why now we've taxonomically reclassified a lot of them. Because there aren't a lot of features that were continuous throughout the family of Trichalomataceae. They're all over the place. Uh, the gills can be separate or they can be attached. There's usually a stem present, but sometimes it's rudimentary to absent in a few species and the stem isn't always centrally located. The spores are usually pale in color, but they can be white, pink, or yellow. They're terrestrial, or they grow on wood, and they're primarily found in woodlands. So there's a lot of variability within this family of Trichalomataceae that is now defunct, uh, but all of these mushrooms that used to be in this, in this family. The Strafariaceae are another good-sized family of fungi. The Strafaria, of course, is the genus that the family name is, is characterized by, but there are a lot of other genera of fungi within this family. And some of these are uh, rather notorious fungi. So we have things like deadly gallerina that are in this family, some of the foliota fungi that uh, can make you rather ill, and other members of this family as well. So this is a family of fungi to be very aware of, but also understanding that there are some fungi within this family that may be a little bit risky. There are saprophytic fungi, so these guys are always going to be growing on dead and decaying matter. They're, they're saprophytes, they break down dead material, and they'll have dark spores. Purple, brown, or black are the general spore colors within this family of fungi. There's usually a veil on Strafariaceae fungi, although there are a few exceptions where a veil is not present. And same with the annulus. There's almost always an annulus, but there's also exceptions where uh, there is not an annulus present on that species. Or often with these fungi, you'll find that the annulus was very small and delicate and has probably been worn away by the elements or eaten by insects. The gills usually meet the stipe on Strafariaceae fungi. They're not decurrent, they don't run down the stipe, and neither are they free, meaning that they don't meet the stipe of the mushroom. Uh, usually the gills will, will directly meet the stipe. And the cap cuticle is often filamentous in this family of fungi. The cap is usually dry, it's usually not slimy or viscid, although there are a few exceptions to this rule where you have like a, a viscid slimy cap in Strafariaceae, but not usually. And most often, the gills uh, feature, feature these sterile microscopic cells that are known as Christocystidia. Uh, and again, that's not a feature that you're going to see unless you have a scope present, but with a microscope, you would see these sterile cells that are diagnostic of this group of fungi. The Cortinariaceae is a family of fungi that used to be composed of multiple genera, 
but is now comprised of only the genus Cortinarius. Cortinarius is a family of fungi with rust brown to orange colored spores uh, that they're rather difficult to ID. It's a confusing group of mushrooms. Um, they're hard to tell apart sometimes, and, and there are some fungi within the genus Cortinarius that can be confused with other edible fungi, but the Cortinarius will have brown to orange spores, whereas these other fungi will not have that spore color. So with Cortinarius, you want to look for those rusty brown spores and the cortina or webbing that is diagnostic of, of the group. The Amanidiaceae, which is kind of fun to say, is a family of fungi composed of the genus Amanita. And this is a rather notorious family of fungi. Uh, they're mycorrhizal with many species of trees. The caps in the Amanita family range widely in size, uh, varying from very small to quite large caps. And the color is widely variable. A cap color might be white, or it might be a variety of very bright colors. Bright yellows and oranges are fairly common within this group of mushrooms. They have white spores, and white are very pale gills. They're known for a universal veil, and the cap can be highly ornamented with bumps or striations on the cap of the mushroom. An annulus is often present as a remnant of the universal veil, but it's not always going to be found either. And with a few exceptions, there will be that base, that bulb that is also known as a vulva at the base of the mushroom. So most Amanita are going to have at least some of these features, either that base or bulb, the annulus, or remnants of the universal veil, or possibly, um, you know, all three. Some, some Amanita are going to have all of those features. This is a really uh, diverse family of, of fungi, and there are some very uh, famous members of the Amanita family. Um, some of the most infamous mushrooms that we see in popular culture belong to the genus Amanita. Uh, Well-known hallucinogenic and deadly species like Amanita muscaria and the destroying angel mushroom are members of this family. So the Amanitas are not a group of mushrooms to be taken lightly. Uh, they're beautiful, but some of them can kill you or have other very negative uh, side effects. So this is a genus of fungi that should not be taken lightly. Um, and should be taken rather seriously, in fact, due to some of the rather notorious members of this group of fungi that can have very negative and sometimes deadly side effects. And we're going to talk about the Bolitaceae. And these are mushrooms that are going to have pores on the underside of the cap rather than gills. Uh, the, there are many members to this group, and we're going to be talking about just uh, just a few of them today that are regularly found in our area. Uh, they're mycorrhizal with many species of trees, uh, both hardwoods and conifers. Most members of this family are mycorrhizal fungi. And as we said, rather than gills, boletes have a layer of spongy tissue uh, that's comprised of thousands of little tubes on the underside of the cap, and they're known as pores. And the shape and size of those pores is often used uh, in diagnostic purposes within this family of fungi. Spore color and pore surface color can both be highly variable, and the flesh on this in this group of fungi can sometimes change rapidly after they're cut or bruised. So if you if you nick the cap, if you bruise the cap or tear a piece off, uh, sometimes you'll see a very rapid or sometimes not so rapid color change occur that is char characteristic of some members of this family of fungi. The cap surface can be dry to slimy, uh, usually dry, but there are some that have a rather slimy or viscid cap texture. And the stiper stem can be highly distinctive, uh, reticulated, meaning that it has a very textured stipe, uh, striations along the stipe of the mushroom, or it might have a specific coloring. Uh, some bolletes have a very distinctive, brightly colored stipe. It can be orange or pink or red. It can be very diagnostic of this group of fungi. Spore prints are helpful with the boletes. Um, often the spores on boletes can be rather brightly colored, and uh, taking a spore print is often a very helpful way to gain a better understanding of which member of the boletes you might be looking at, because boletes can be really, really difficult to identify sometimes. Um, 
sometimes it, it comes down to things like pore size and spore color. So uh, looking at some of these different features is often helpful in trying to identify bully mushrooms. Looking for that color change on the flesh of the mushroom, you can see here where this one is already starting to bruise a purpley blue color after the flesh has been torn. Again, very diagnostic of this group of fungi. The family Agaricaceae is a good sized family of mushrooms that is composed of multiple genera. Uh, Agaricus, Chlorophyllum, Lepiota, and Caprinus are all members of this family. With this group of mushrooms in annulus, so that little ring around the stipe is almost always present. And gills are almost always white to pinkish when young. They become brown with age uh, because the spores in this group of mushrooms are always going to be chocolate brown to black. And they, they, as they uh, mature, as the mushroom matures, those chocolate brown to black spores change that gill color to a very dark brown or black. And the gills in this family of fungi are usually free from the stipe. As you can see in the picture on the right, it's a really good example of what free gills look like, where they don't quite meet the stipe of the mushroom, but are rather slightly separate from it. The genus Agaricus is a group of mushrooms that is very characteristic of this family, and they tend to have all of the features that we just talked about. That annulus that's almost always present, uh, free gills, and that dark chocolate brown spore print, and there are members of the genus Agaricus that you might be very familiar with because they are the button mushrooms that you might be putting on your pizza. However, please don't think that the genus Agaricus is composed of only safe mushrooms. There are several families, I'm sorry, there are several members of this genus that are very toxic and they are very difficult to tell apart at times. So just stick with the, uh, the button mushrooms that you find in the grocery store uh, when it comes to the genus Agaricus. Another group of mushrooms within uh, the Agaricaceae are the meadow mushrooms, as they're sometimes known. They're saprophytic terrestrial mushrooms that are often found growing on lawns or in green spaces, on golf courses. These are mushrooms that were often asked about because people come in contact with them regularly uh, because they do so often grow in urban areas, in terrestrial areas. And the spore print is white to pale buff or sometimes a dull greenish color. These are often known as parasol mushrooms because they do grow in these open areas. They tend to have a really large uh, parasol-like a cap that spreads out with a very centralized umbrella-like stipe on the underside of that cap. And uh, there are a lot of members to this group. The caps are often dry or scaly uh, with, with scales that might come off easily on your hands when you handle members of this group of mushrooms. And there's often a distinctive dot or bump in the center of the cap that you'll see with these guys. Uh, the gills are usually free and pale in color. As we've said, that's rather diagnostic of most agaricaceae. And they tend to leave remnants of that partial veil behind, as well as an annulus. So you might see little raggedy bits of the veil left behind around the edge of the cap, and then that central annulus on the stipe on the underside of the cap. Also in the agaricaceae is the genus Caprinus. Uh, these tend to have brown to black spores rather than green or lighter color spores like we'd see in some of the other mushrooms we just talked about. And the top of the cap is often scaly or striate. These mushrooms are often referred to as inky cap mushrooms because within this genus of Caprinus, the gills and the cap tends to digest themselves and, and dissolve into this black inky goo as the mushroom matures. They're rather fragile and tend to break apart quite easily when you handle them. And these mushrooms, as with other agaricaceae, tend to be saprophytic. Uh, they're found growing on decaying wood or found growing in grassy areas. The Cantharelliaceae are a group of fungi that include the Cantharellus and Craterellus uh, genera, and these are chanterelle mushrooms. They're mostly mycorrhizal, although there are some members of this family that are saprophytic. And they mostly grow in woodland environments. So unlike the agaricaceae that we talked about, these guys are going to be growing in wooded environments rather than in open fields or lawns. Uh, they're funnel or vase-shaped fruiting bodies, and they lack true gills. 
So in this family, you'll see the, these kind of pseudo gills, these blunt folded over gills on the underside of the cap uh, that tend to fork as they reach the margins of the cap. So that's an important diagnostic key with this group of fungi is being on the lookout for these folded over kind of pseudo gills that run down the cap and knowing that if you see true gills, you're definitely not looking at a chanterelle. You're not looking at a member of the Cantharelli ACA. All right, we've been talking about things with gills or pores so far, and for a minute now, we're going to talk about gastromycetes. Gastromycetes are fungi that, uh, they're, they're stomach fungi, so gastro meaning stomach-like, and these are fungi that hold their spores inside of their fruiting structure. So no gills, no pores, nothing like that. Instead, they hold their spores inside of the fruiting structure of that mushroom, and that's uh, where they're released from. There are multiple families and genera that are known as gastromycetes, and we're going to talk about just a few of them today. Uh, these include Philaceae, which are stinkhorn mushrooms, as well as earth stars, the geastrum, and uh, fungi that we normally think of as puffballs in the Sclerodermataceae and the Agaricaceae. Yes, there are members of the Agaricaceae, the family of mushrooms that we already talked about, that are also uh, going to be gastromycetes. So Agaricaceae is a very large group of fungi, and where before we talked about members of this family that had uh, gills, we're going to talk about a few members of the Agaricaceae that have um, they have their spores internally also that are gastromycetes. Uh, the spores develop inside the fruiting body, as we said. They're either going to be found in a slimy matrix known as a gleba, which is what you see in the stinkhorns, um, or in, in specialized packets if they're not born inside the mushroom. Uh, the spores tend to disperse with wind or rain or other disruptions, maybe an animal stepping on the, on the fruiting body. And these mushrooms are mostly saprophytes. They feed on dead and decaying material by and large. I can't think of any members of this group right now that are, um, that are mycorrhizal or need a living host. As far as I know, they all feed on dead and decaying material. They tend to grow in open or grassy areas, and uh, they are sometimes found in forest settings and well, but most of them are found um, growing in these open or grassy environments on dead and decaying material, either mulch or um, some, other, some other decaying stuff on the landscape. Polypore fungi are a group of fungi that used to be held in one family, which we called the Polyporiaceae, but have since been reclassified into a number of different families and genera. Uh, so the Fomatopsidaceae, the Grifolaceae, the Polyporiaceae, these are all families that used to all be lumped under the family Polyporaceae, but have now been reclassified. Um, but we're going to talk about them all today as polypore fungi, uh, because that is the primary characteristic that ties them all together and is a helpful way to think about them uh, when you're thinking about IDing these fungi. Uh, polypore fungi are known for having these pores on the underside of the fruiting body. So we already talked about this a little bit with the boletes, uh, that they have these pores rather than gills, um, but the polypores are fungi that almost always grow on wood. They're not going to be found mycorrhizally or growing uh, saprophytically on the ground. These are fungi that grow on wood, and uh, they tend to have a number of pore features that tie them together. Uh, pore shape and size can be highly variable. Um, the shape and the color can be highly variable. Uh, but your fruiting bodies are often very woody and tough with a few notable exceptions. They can be parasitic or saprophytic on trees. Uh, so as we said, almost all of these fungi want to grow on wood rather than uh, terrestrially on the ground, but they can be parasites, meaning that they need a living host, or they can be saprophytes that feed on uh, rotting wood. And the vast majority of wood rotting fungi are going to be macroscopic wood rotting fungi that we can visually see are going to be polypore fungi. Uh, there's also, they're also an important group of plant pathogenic fungi. Many uh, pathogens 
that are macroscopic, again, that we can see, are going to be polypores. So parasitic fungi that feed on living trees and may sometimes lead to tree stress, decline, and possibly even tree death. They're common spring and fall fruiters in our region. You'll find polypores fruiting in the summer too, but a lot of the very showy, noticeable members of this group of fungi are going to be found fruiting in the spring and fall. So like the chicken of the woods here, or hen of the woods, uh, those are going to be spring or fall fruiting mushrooms, uh, the, and they are uh, polypore fungi. Tooth fungi, just like the polypores that we talked about, used to be all in one family that we called the Hidenaceae, like tooth fungi, uh, but have again since been reclassified. Guys, taxonomy is a really interesting thing, and with advances in genetics, uh, we've been able to better understand how a lot of organisms are related to each other, and so things that we thought before were related, we've now found are not that closely related, and so many things have been taxonomically reclassified. But we're going to talk about tooth fungi as if they were all one group, while in fact they are composed of multiple uh, families and genera, which will, we have kind of outlined here below. Basidiospores in this group of fungi are produced on teeth rather than pores or gills. Um, so all the little teeth on the underside of the cap have basidiospores on them. Uh, that's how these, these fungi reproduce and disperse their spores. Cap color is highly variable within this group of mushrooms, um, and they may be parasitic or saprophytic. They, are, they can be found growing on wood, or they can be mycorrhizal. Um, hedgehog mushrooms are mycorrhizal fungi that are, that are tooth fungi, uh, whereas a lot of other members of this group, like the herisium, can be found growing on wood. Um, those, are, those are fungi that are going to be either parasites or saprophytes on living or dead trees. The, the herisium fungi, which you might know as lion's mane. Coral fungi, again, we're continuing this theme of fungi that are uh, used to be all comprised in one family but have been since reclassified. Uh, these are fruiting bodies that are simple and upright. They're thought of as more possibly primitive fungi because they lack gills or pores or teeth or any of these fancy structures. Rather, the basidiospores are just born directly on these spindle-like um, upright clubs or coral-like forms of the, of the fungi. They're highly variable in color. There are a lot of very brightly colored um, mushrooms within the coral fungi that can be pink or yellow or purple. I've seen a lot of really, really cool um, fungi within this group of mushrooms that have really variable coloration. So um, definitely a, a really interesting group of fungi. All right, so that's all we're going to talk about today for common mushroom families uh, that we find here in the southeast. And keep in mind, these are just mushrooms that we can readily see that are macroscopic. There are tons of fungi all around us that are microscopic that we might never really notice or see but that play really important roles in the ecology and pathology of our woodlands and ecosystems here in the eastern U.S. and really everywhere throughout the world. Fungi are just fascinating. Um, I hope that you all learned something today, and uh, happy mushroom hunting!